I'm Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from the week in tech. Coming up, our exclusive interview with America Mobile Chairman Emeritus and one of the richest men in the world, Carlos Slim. We'll catch up with him in Mexico City. Plus, Bloomberg's week-long focus on energy. We'll catch up with Sunrun CEO Lynn Jurich on what a Trump presidency means for the solar industry. And we get our hands on Snap's spectacles and insight on the product from Snap investor Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed Ventures. First, to our lead. This week, we heard from billionaire Carlos Slim, Mexico's richest person, for an exclusive interview from Mexico City. The America Mobile chairman emeritus says AT&T's aggressive pricing strategies in Mexico are causing the company to, quote, lose a lot of money. He also chimed in on U.S. President-elect Trump, saying Mexico needs to return its focus inward after his presidential win. Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker caught up with Slim from the Mexico Year Ahead 2017 Summit. Take a listen. We are mainly in Latin America. Uh, we have a big operation in U.S. and uh, something in, in, in Europe. And uh, we always... Uh, take care of our investments because we cannot uh, get behind in technology, in capacity uh, to have to offer to our customers the best service and we cannot stop this uh, because of any reason. Does well, it get some time, so it get cheaper because now we pay less for what we are going to do in dollar terms. In dollar terms will be lower, but in local currencies will be it's cheaper, higher. Um, the the concerns that you have about the effect of Trump policies on the domestic economy and America's standing in the world, does that change the calculus that you may have for some of your assets in the United States? You own a very no. large wireless, a prepaid wireless company, TrackPhone. No, I think uh, uh, there is any change about, uh, about that. No, he's talking about uh, climate change. Let's look what he's going to mm -hmm. do because he's not telling that he will get out of climate change. That's very important. Uh, about the leadership of U.S., but one side, he said that he will get out of everywhere, but by the other thing, he wants to make a stronger army, a stronger uh, military mm -hmm. uh, uh, country, and maybe he's looking to, to negotiate the, the resources that will pay for that. He has told that they will charge to some countries. Thus, I think it's an issue of negotiations. Negotiations to make a, a U.S. pay less for many of these things. What is but the... he's talking about corruption in Washington. That's good for our country. Yeah, that's good for everyone. Rooting out corruption. Yes. I would like to think rooting out corruption is good for everybody. I know. Well, he said corruption that is the, the lobbying of uh, uh, ex-officials of government and Congress. Mm. Um, I mentioned this business you have, TrackPhone. What's the long-term strategy for that business? Is it to continue as it is now, to maybe merge it with a wireless carrier, or perhaps to sell it at some In point? In the short term, it's a follow like we are doing. We need to follow what is happening in the in industry. It, the, the industry is moving very fast, and uh, we are uh, alert of what is moving, what is coming. And uh, depending on all these things, uh, we will take a decision in his right moment. So what's more likely to happen in the longer term? The longer term is very difficult to, to define in this mm -hmm. moment. Uh, but uh, we are uh, working in the short term to, to what we have done to make it profitable. They have a, a good uh, uh, operation, a good market share, etc. And here in Mexico, your former partner in Telmex, AT&T, is now the greatest threat yes. to, your, to your wireless business. Is AT&T playing fair? We know that uh, they, uh, they were going to come to compete because we opened the door. Uh, we opened the door, like you know, they have a, a big piece of, uh, for many years of, uh, of uh, uh, America Mobile. Yes. Uh, at the, since the beginning in 91, they have 10%. Actually, in 91, they have 10% of tel Telmex, and those, those times was Telmex. And uh, 
we, we open the door to them buying his part. If we don't buy the part, they will not be here because they were, were not legal. And uh, they are getting very aggressive, maybe a little more than what is intelligible. They are losing a lot of money. I don't know how much, but they are losing a lot of money. You can see that in the balance sheets. Winning market, uh, uh, that's uh, the strategy they, they take. Uh, what is very surprise, and that's for me a surprise, is that they are selling very, very low price here, less than 50% of the price in US. That means that uh, it's a surprise that they are selling, not at the American, at the US prices, but less than 50% of the price in US. Is that anti-competitive behavior? I don't know. You, you need to you make your, 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 your judge it. I think you know more about those regulators than I do. Um, but what can you do? What can America Mobile do to stop AT&T from taking your market share if oh. they continue to price at that level? No, they are not taking too much market. Uh, uh, they are subsidizing too much the handsets. Uh, they are taking, well, they are taking some market also from competitors. But as much as it is good for the consumers, we are happy. Coming up, we will hear from the CEO of Box, Aaron Levy, as the company's latest results top estimates, plus what he thinks the Trump administration will mean for the tech industry. And payment provider Stripe gets $150 million in funding and creates Ireland's youngest billionaires are exclusive with Stripe's CFO. This is Bloomberg. Enterprise cloud company Box rose the most in months this week after it announced earnings that beat estimates. The company showed strong sales growth in the third quarter. I caught up with Box CEO Aaron Levy. Take a listen. Two things that we've been benefiting from. First of all, we've been building a, a platform for 11 years now that's just very differentiated from the rest of the competitive landscape. So as more and more enterprises need to be able to move their data to the cloud and be able to manage it securely, uh, we happen to have the most competitive product in the market for helping large companies and, uh, and companies of all sizes be able to store, share, collaborate, and manage all of their information um, in, a, uh, in a very secure way. So uh, that's what, what has been going well. And then we're just benefiting from the fact that most uh, enterprises all around the world need to modernize their infrastructure. They need to modernize the way they work. Um, and we happen to be in the right place at the right time from a product standpoint for that. Now, looking forward, do you see growth coming from expanding sales to existing customers or more so from adding new customers? It's going to be a mix of both. So, you know, one, one of the cool things about our product is, is that it uh, makes sense for any size business in any industry anywhere around the world. So we do see pretty dramatic expansion simply happening because of new customers coming on board. We now have 69,000 uh, businesses that use the product. At the same time, we're seeing continued expansion within existing accounts. So some of our new products that we launched throughout the past year and a half um, that are sort of add-on products in terms of, of the revenue model uh, have actually been performing very well. So we think we'll, we'll both expand uh, in terms of new product sales to existing customers as well as being able to reach all new markets and all new segments of the, uh, of the customer landscape. Now, you guys already have partnerships with some big tech companies, IBM, Microsoft. Now you've got a partnership with Google yep. as well as Facebook. Do you have any concern that these bigger companies will add box type functionality to their own platform? Well, I think part of the reason for the partnerships is to, to try and power that type of functionality for those companies. And at what's uh, really unique about SaaS and the cloud is as enterprises move to the cloud, they're going to be using more applications than ever before in their enterprise. Some companies have 30, 50, 100 different SaaS providers that power different parts of their enterprise. So you might be using Salesforce.com, you might be using Workday, you might be using Facebook Workplace, you might be using Slack, you might be using Office 365, but you're going to want your content and your data to be able to store it securely in one place that then connects to all those applications. So our fundamental strategy is to actually be the agnostic horizontal platform that connects to all those different services. Now, uh, you, like many in Silicon Valley, were vocal about the presidential election. You guys had a conference where you... Uh, Call, you, you had a tagline, make software great again, sort of, sort of making light yes, of things. Yes, that was when it was a joke. So. <laughs> 
Now that we know the results, yes. uh, you recently tweeted the first test of if Trump can keep America great is if he can recognize the pain he's created for many and help the country move forward. Yeah. What are your biggest concerns? Well, I think there's uh, there's probably two big uh, components of of Trump specifically moving into office. The first is, uh, you know, I think the campaign that we saw over the past year, uh, the rhetoric from the campaign created a lot of divisiveness in the country, and we've seen that uh, kind of play out over the past couple of weeks. So I think the first thing is he needs a very strong message um, that is uh, is one of the the sort of social issues and the inclusion that, that we need as a country, and uh, and to be able to actually build great organizations and to be able to innovate. And so that that would be the first and, and most important thing I think I would I would want to you know see from the new administration the second part is um, you know we have a bunch of issues in the tech industry that relate to policy and relate to government regulation but these are uh, uh, increasingly not becoming tech uh, issues only they're becoming issues for the rest of the economy You're talking about immigration trade and 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 even things that are are tech uh, specific today but are going to impact how every company eventually is able to stay innovative as we imagine car companies having to move to autonomous vehicles life sciences companies having to have precision medicine manufacturing companies moving to more automated manufacturing the issues that we see in silicon valley today around encryption and privacy and patents and um, and how we actually have to drive innovation are going to be applicable to every company on the planet. And so while we sort of think about these issues as Silicon Valley issues, they're going to be issues for every large enterprise, every type of company that, uh, that exists. That was Box CEO Aaron Levy. Turning now to Samsung, South Korea's most valuable company climbed to a record this week after announcing a series of moves, including handing shareholders a 36% increase in per share dividends. The company also announced it may split as soon as next year, responding to pressure from activist hedge fund Paul Singer's Elliott Management. We caught up with Bloomberg's managing editor for Asia tech coverage Peter Elstrom from Tokyo just as the news broke, along with Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick in New York. The big news I'd say out of this is that Samsung has decided it is going to uh, return more cash to shareholders, specifically through dividends and through some share buybacks. It said in the past that it wants to return about 30 to 50 percent of its free cash flow to shareholders. As it's done that, the amount of cash that it has on hand has increased. So now it's saying that it's going to go to the very top end of that range. 50 percent of its free cash flow is going to go back to shareholders, either through dividends or through bear buybacks. It's going to begin by increasing the uh, dividend for 2017 by 36 uh, percent. It's also going to move from a, a twice a year dividend to a four times a year dividend. So it's going to increase that. In addition to that, they're going they say that um, by next year they're going to nominate uh, an independent uh, director with global experience to their board. And they're also going to look at some of these structural changes, including the split into a holding company and an operating company. Now, David, you believe that uh, Samsung's current corporate governance structure is archaic and simply just can't survive in, in this day and age. Thank you for characterizing my views. Um, <laughs> I absolutely am amazed that Samsung has done as well as it has as this secretive family controlled company that is caught up in all of the relatively questionable governance issues that Korean business in general suffers from, and they're now hit by the double whammy of having had a disastrous product development that is going to lose them at least $6 billion this year, plus being in an environment in Korea where the relationship between government and business is highly suspect because of this extreme uh, corruption uh, scandal that's happening with the president and it involves Samsung among other companies. So I think they have to go a lot further than what this new news suggests they might do. One outside director, that's not enough. They need probably, as, as I think Elliot has proposed, to go public in the United States to really have the transparency that comes with the kind of company they're competing with, which is Google and Apple and companies like that. I really think that is one of the main reasons why they had this big problem with the Note 7 which was a, an inexcusable corporate problem to have. That was Bloomberg Managing Editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom from Tokyo, and David Kirkpatrick in New York. Coming up, this week was Energy Week here at Bloomberg. We asked the CEO of solar company Sunrun if Trump's presidency puts the clean energy industry in danger. Next. And China is looking to compete with the U.S. and Russia in the race to space. We'll dive into the country's private space ambitions next. This is Bloomberg.
This week on Bloomberg, we focused in on energy. First up, solar. In the weeks following Donald Trump's election, there's been endless speculation on what the future of solar energy will look like in the United States. Trump campaigned on promises to bring back coal mining jobs and scrap President Obama's clean energy initiatives. Some of those initiatives helped scale up the use of solar, which increased 30-fold under Obama, with solar jobs growing 12 times faster than the rest of the economy. We caught up with Sunrise CEO Lynn Jurich and our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, on the road ahead for the industry. You know, I'm not concerned at all. Renewables are absolutely here to stay. The, you know, the cost performance is just gonna... there and the people want it. And, you know, just to highlight um, what voters wanted, if we look at the federal election, um, where the energy policy gets set is really more at that state level. And there were two places where there was a voting based on rooftop solar, and that was in Florida and that was in Arizona, or Nevada, excuse me. And in Florida, the same voters that elected Trump and Rubio also voted to keep rooftop solar into the state. So you're actually seeing that rooftop solar is very of the moment. It, it creates the jobs people want, the domestic jobs. It brings affordable solar energy to people, and it brings competition. And that's a very bipartisan um, uh, a set of characteristics. Okay, but there's still some question about how Donald Trump feels about it. Uh, let's take a listen. He hasn't said very much uh, since being elected, but let's, let's take a listen to one thing he did say. On energy, I will cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. That's what we want. That's what we've been waiting for. When you hear him say that, uh, when you hear concern about tax credits getting rolled back, I mean, what's your response? Well, I think first what he's saying is we're investing in infrastructure and we're investing in jobs. And we're investing in domestic jobs. And that's precisely what we're doing. So as you're saying, as you said in the opening comments, the jobs in solar are growing 12 times that of the rest of the economy. And so I, I see it very consistent with his message. The other benefit about the rooftop solar is that what we're really competing with is we're really competing with um, the price of retail power. And that's why it's so efficient and why it will win long term. It just makes sense to use the existing rooftop infrastructure and to produce the power where it's delivered. So we're not really competing um, with the centralized um, power sources. We're competing um, with the whole cost to actually transmit them over to the home. Now on to the tax credits. I will say that the tax credit was a policy that was um, extended under Republican-led Congress. That was, um, that was a George Bush era policy. It sunsets after four to five years. And that's what's so great about this industry is that that we, our cost reductions that we are realizing are, make it so that to subsidize this industry makes a ton of sense. It's working. It's creating the jobs and it's bringing the savings to people. Hey, Lynn, I wonder if we will sort of drill down. I, I, I buy your argument that the state policy has tended to drive solar more than federal. But I, when I look at what's happening with your company in places that maybe you're succeeding and others aren't, I'm, I have trouble distinguishing between the companies. Solar City, in, in, in point of fact, right, has massively cut their guidance towards how many megawatts they're going to install. They operate in many of the same markets where Sunrun is, and you guys have not cut that. And I wonder how you're seeing the world differently from they are. Well, the benefit of our industry is that um, we have a available market size that is vastly beyond where we are today. So if you just look at U.S. households, we're penetrated 2 3%. But when you actually look out over 10 years with the cost reductions we're expecting, that can be 20% which means that we would deliver a 20% annual growth rate over 10 years. I've been very consistent to say that this industry can sustain that. Now, during that time period, there can be um, companies that get over levered. There can be companies that get in trouble. But one of the things that I'm most proud of now is, you know, it's our sixth quarter being public, and we've delivered nice, strong, consistent growth. And if you look at our performance year to date, we are 50% year over year in terms of the number of megawatts that we've installed. Now, the Tesla Solar City merger has been a Approved. How does this impact you? Does a, a bigger, more diverse, more end to end uh, Tesla give them more power? You know, I applaud the merger. I think it's very good for the industry. We are operating in a, um, a $400 billion annual industry. That's what retail energy is. We welcome the innovation. We welcome strong companies. We welcome strong brands to educate consumers that rooftop solar is here. It's inevitable. Um, it's a good choice for the home. So I think it will lift all boats, and we, we welcome them in the industry. 
Well, and to that point, with how well you guys are doing, on my Bloomberg terminal, I've got uh, the Sunrun stock chart, but maybe more importantly, if we go into the terminal, we can, just by typing FACF, we look at your cash flow statement, we scroll through your cash flow statement, and we get to a beautiful, beautiful free cash flow chart, or maybe not so much. You're, you're going through a lot of free cash flow here. Uh, big losses, a little bit better than it has been, but what is your, how do you intend to reduce the free cash flow burn that, that, has, uh, that you guys have been in for such a long time here? You know, it's interesting. We've held our cash balance flat at $200 million for over four quarters. So, um, so if you actually look at that cash balance, it is held flat. And we, not only have we done that, but we've delivered that while we've grown the business. Last year, we grew the business 80%. Again, this year, it was 50%. So we're investing in that growth. We're investing in policy. We're investing in R&D. We have a lot of exciting things happening in terms of how we're incorporating storage into the um, panels. And we're holding our cash balance um, steady. So what you're seeing is very strong contribution margins for every one of the new solar companies that we acquire. China is spending billions of dollars on its space program, building a rival to the U.S. and Russia. And it's not simply a state-led effort. Entrepreneurs are also investing in the space race. Bloomberg's China correspondent Tom McKenzie has more on the story from Xinjiang. Here in a desert closer to Kabul than Beijing, China's private space ambitions are taking flight. Technicians are putting the final touches to a one-ton capsule called Traveller 2, connected to a giant helium balloon. It's designed to climb to near space, 20 kilometers above sea level. The company behind the project, Quanqi, has lofty ambitions. It wants to commercialize manned near space travel by 2020. First, though, they have to test the flight controls, capsule to control communications, and the life support system. You've probably heard about the monkeys and dogs that were sent into space. Well, the Traveller 2 is going to be transporting this little guy, a two-inch terrapin. Huangqi chairman Liu Ruopeng is hailed by some as China's Elon Musk. He wants to make near space travel accessible to as many people as possible. And by designing a craft with reusable parts, he hopes to keep tickets below $100,000 per person. Our goal is to make normal people to go to the near space. Because if you go, go by rocket or by some other technologies, it will either give you a crazy speeding up or crazy uh, dropping, dropping down process, uh, which is very difficult for, for normal people to, to go. But what we want to develop is that it goes smoothly and that smoothly. It's just like taking a space elevator. Liu's ambitions dovetail with China's bid to compete in a space race with the US, Russia and Asian neighbors India and Japan. The country aims to build and operate its first space station by 2022. It wants to send an astronaut to the moon by 2025 and land an unmanned vehicle on Mars. In October, China launched Shenzhou 11, sending two astronauts into orbit for China's longest mission yet. And Quanqi, though a private company, is backed by state money. The final frontier is still dangerous, though, and a long way off. Half an hour after launch and at just 12 kilometers above the Earth, Traveller 2's systems failed. The mission was aborted, and the fate of its turtle crew is, sadly, unknown. Tom McKenzie, Bloomberg, Xinjiang. Coming up, Facebook remains in the spotlight over fake news. Should the social network be held accountable? Axel Springer, CEO, weighs in. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg technology. I'm Emily Chang. Investors are rushing to snap up shares of Snapchat's parent company ahead of next year's IPO. But they're having little luck as they search the typical sources of private stock, employees and other investors. This according to a report by The Information. Consumers are facing the same challenges as they scout out the company's first hardware product, Spectacles. We were able to get our hands on the elusive specs. Snap's first investor, Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed Venture Partners, brought the gadget over for a test run.
How did you get your spectacles? So uh, I have a I, feeling you did not wait in line for six hours. I, uh, I have some friends at Snapchat and I called in a favor. If you don't have friends at Snapchat, the only way to get your hands on Snap's new camera-clad spectacles is to stand in line for hours at pop-up vending machines across the country. $130 a pair or up to thousands on eBay. Let's do it. Lightspeed's Jeremy Liu was a lucky one. He's one of Snap's first investors, so he didn't have to wait. How does it work? So uh, there's a little button here on the top, and when I press it, it starts recording video. And you can see the light's gone on, so you yeah. know that you're being recorded right now. And after uh, it stops, then uh, it syncs through Bluetooth to my phone. So when I open my Snapchat app, it'll sync through to uh, get the video directly into Snapchat. The specs come in edgy colors, teal and coral, and a more muted black and charge when clicked into the case with a rechargeable battery. They've got a certain cool factor, but you gotta wonder if spectacles will actually make a cool dent in Snap's business. When you heard that Snapchat was going to make something like this, was going to get into hardware, what did you think? What I found is that uh, Evan and the team there have just demonstrated that they know better than anyone else what their users will want. My turn. <laughs> All yours. Let me know Give what you think. Give it a try. And you're recording. Oh, I'm recording. Can you see the little white? In oh, the yeah. Of your hey. Eye? The camera records circular video, allowing you to hold your phone vertically or horizontally to see the scene. So I went zip lining with my daughter and not having to worry about dropping a camera or a phone, but being able to record that experience, it was really pretty fantastic. So why do you think spectacles will do any better than these? I Google think Glass. Kind of obvious just looking at them, <laughs> don't you? Obvi, right? Remember Google Glass retailed at $1,500, more than 11 times more than Spectacles. It could do a lot more things, though. Jeremy Liu believes that Snap's price point will help get the product into the hands of the masses. But will Spectacles be able to have long-term staying power? I want to bring back Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt. So you haven't tried it. Not yet. Not but so. you just saw our little experience there. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. What do you think? So I think it's it's a brilliant move. I mean, Snapchat is, is executing so well on so many different levels, and it's very difficult for especially a software company to execute on hardware, and they're doing it in a very snap kind of way. They're doing it by making it a toy, making it playful, making it fun, and also, of course, introducing a price point that's accessible for a lot of people. Brilliant is a strong word. Really? Brilliant? I think it is. Even even the execution of their distribution. They're they're creating these vending machines. I mean, vending machines, when, since when were vending machines cool? Somehow they made vending machines kind of cool and also a marketing campaign by dropping them in different cities. They're they're making them feel very exclusive, that's yes. for sure. I mean, I will say that I walked into it feeling very skeptical, but I could certainly see, A, uh, you would love these if you were a huge Snapchat user because it's just so easy to get the video to your phone and then into your app. Mm -hmm. um, B, if you have kids, uh, it sort of takes away that awkward moment when you pull out your phone and your kid yeah. automatically stops doing that cute thing that they were doing that you wanted to get a picture of. But do you think this is actually something that's going to add revenue to the bottom line or drive usage well, in, a, in, a, in a big way? Yeah, long term, I believe this movement, it's not necessarily Spectacles, the first product, the first version that necessarily will, but it's the first step towards a hardware snap company. Now to a story we are watching. German prosecutors are investigating Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and a number of other executives after complaints of hate speech. Lawyer Chan Jo Jun claims that the social network acted unlawfully by failing to remove posts that incite hatred or violence. Jun provides examples of hundreds of posts denying the Holocaust, calling for violence and expressing support for terror groups. Facebook said, quote, the allegations lack merit. Meantime, the CEO of Axel Springer, one of the biggest media companies in Europe, said politicians should resist calls to regulate Facebook as a media company. This despite concerns surrounding fake news on the social network during the U.S. election. Matthias Dopfner made the comments in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg. Take a listen. I think it is a tremendous distribution platform. I really stick to Mark Zuckerberg's philosophy that it is about uh, connecting people. So it is a platform a bit like a telco in the old days. 
it brings people together, it facilitates communication. Perhaps in a couple of years it will be uh, virtual reality conversations that we have on Facebook. But Facebook is a technology company and a platform. It's not a publisher. It is not a content producer. It takes no responsibility for content and it should not take responsibility for content. I think it's a totally misleading debate. Uh, you cannot blame people uh, what they have shared uh, during a telephone conversation. So the only restriction for Facebook, I think, should be the rule of law. What is uh, against the Constitution, what brings people into jail, uh, that cannot be published on Facebook. Uh, but I, I think the whole idea that they should have a kind of super editor, that would then transform Facebook into a global media monopoly. And that's really going to a wrong direction from various points of view. Coming up, we will be talking to the CFO of Stripe, William Gabrick. The company just raised $150 million in its latest funding round and aims for rapid growth. The company strategy is next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Microsoft held its annual meeting on Wednesday, and one of the biggest topics covered was the cloud. The company is on course to pull in $20 billion in annual sales from its corporate cloud business by 2018. Speaking at the meeting, CEO Satya Nadella described the massive scope of the plans. By 2025, our society will produce 180 zettabytes of data. In fact, we're running out of words to describe the number of bytes we're gathering. Our role is to ensure that the data is not just an exhaust, but is converted into actionable, helpful insights and intelligence. This year's Cyber Monday set a new record according to Adobe Digital Insights. This signals a huge shift in consumer habits. Americans spent $3.45 billion Monday, a 12% increase from last year. Enter Stripe, the payment service that just raised $150 million, doubling its valuation to $9.2 billion. Its focus on online merchants gives it an edge over competitors as retail shifts away from traditional brick and mortar. I spoke with William Gay Brick, CFO at Stripe, for an exclusive interview. Stripe is a software infrastructure platform for building an online business and in particular for accepting payments. Uh, with this round, uh, I don't think there's anything that we sort of ring fence the capital for in particular. You know, I think what has got investors really excited about Stripe is the momentum that we've carried through uh, 2016. Uh, 2016 was a year of building for scale at Stripe and, and scale has come. Uh, in particular, a lot of really big companies have been joining Stripe. Um, SAP, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Target, uh, UNICEF uh, have all joined the Stripe platform. Uh, you know, in addition, we've opened up four new markets, uh, France, Spain, uh, Singapore, Japan, and launched a bunch of great new products, uh, products like Radar, that's a fraud product, and Atlas, which is for incorporating a business. And so I think as we look into 2017, the capital is really just to double down on those efforts, uh, open up a bunch of new markets, and just be ready for uh, the scale to come. So you mentioned Bloomingdale's and Macy, Cyber Monday spending up now 12%. How do you guys continue to monetize and capitalize on this trend? Well, I think that, you know, as you mentioned a second ago, up 12% year over year. Uh, yesterday was a huge, huge day for Stripe users. And we see more and more commerce uh, moving from, from offline to online. So Stripe is really about uh, being an ally to startups and technology companies and giving them the tools to accelerate their businesses, to go global, to build marketplaces and platforms, and uh, sort of pioneer new business models. So $9 billion is double Square's market cap. Uh, is the difference justified, and why? Well, uh, Stripe and Square are very different businesses. Uh, and in, in fact, you know, Square is a business that I greatly admire. Uh, it's a great business, uh, but it serves a very different user base and is solving a very different problem. Uh, so, you know, for Square, you're looking at the you know, huge market of millions of small businesses across the country, largely offline, uh, coffee shops, hair salons, things like that. Stripe, in turn, is very focused on technology companies. And so these are often very high growth companies, uh, building businesses online and taking advantage of the new opportunities the internet creates. So on that note, analysts estimate you guys processed $20 billion last year. 
What's the, the estimate or the forecast for this year and how fast do you expect that number to grow? Well, so as a private company, we, we don't report any financials right now. We haven't confirmed any numbers. Uh, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, we are seeing a lot of great scale driven in particular by a lot of really large users joining Stripe. So uh, we've been talking a lot about the political situation. Obviously, you mentioned uh, you guys have a lot of uh, international efforts, international expansion happening. You have a partnership with Alipay. In China, I know that you, uh, you are now in Cuba as a result of uh, the White House opening relations, relations with Cuba. Now we have a president who says, uh, president-elect, who says he wants to curb trade, uh, curb our trade relationship with China, uh, potentially end uh, the relationship with Cuba. Are you concerned at all about Stripe's business? Well, as you note, Emily, uh, earlier this year, uh, when the president was making uh, his historic trip down to Cuba, actually reached out to Stripe in particular to invite us down there. In fact, a lot of entrepreneurs on the ground in Cuba were asking for Stripe to be there because of our Atlas product. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Stripe will always be about economic inclusion. Uh, we're really about building the technologies to create a more economically interconnected world. You know, what it means with the new administration joining, you know, I'm not the expert to talk about policy or sort of macro conditions. What I can say is there's strong evidence that the new administration is quite pro-business, that you know, job creation and stoking uh, the economy in general is, is a priority, and so we're aligned at least in that way. Coming up, he is known as the hacking boy genius who cracked the iPhone and turned down a job from Elon Musk. George Hotz gives us an update on his regulation-defying self-driving car technology. This is Bloomberg. Noted investor Whitney Tilson spoke on Bloomberg Television about his outlook on the markets and his investments this week, including his short position on Tesla. Although the Solar City deal took a big chunk out of the company's stock, Tilson is taking a cautious approach. I'm so tempted to short it. I got destroyed shorting it last time on the big run up, you know, from 30 to 200 or something. Um, and it's made me cautious uh, of shorting it, partly because I got burned before, but partly because, you know, you can construct the most perfect bear case on it about rising competition and the company's hemorrhaging money and uh, the Solar City acquisition is just going to add to their losses and certainly is added to their debt load, et cetera, et cetera. Hacker George Hotz shocked the auto industry last year when he showed off a working autonomous car jury-rigged in his own garage. He went on to reportedly turn down a job offer from Elon Musk, instead founding his own company, Comma AI, that promised to sell self-driving software kits for $999. That plan came to a screeching halt last month when U.S. regulators sent Hotz a warning over Comma One safety concerns. He scrapped the plan and tweeted, would much rather spend my life building amazing tech than dealing with regulators and lawyers. It isn't worth it. Kama AI will be exploring other markets and products. Hello from Shenzhen, China. But not so fast. Hots came back this week announcing a plan to open source his self-driving software, giving it away for free. He joined us to explain why. It supports right now select Hondas and Acuras and self-driving cars. So you still have to pay attention at all times. Um, but there's certain scenarios that you can take your hands off the wheel and not touch either pedal and the car will drive by itself. Okay, so regulators weren't too happy about your original plan. How do they feel about this one? Um, well, I, had, I don't know, I haven't heard from them. The, the real thing, the regulator's response I thought was very reasonable. The problem was when it came. We were not selling a product. We were not even taking pre-orders for a product and they were already asking me for things like a user manual under oath easier to just cancel and pivot. So haven't you just really upped the ante here and do you expect to get more than just a warning? No, I mean, we're not selling a product. Nishta regulates the sales of products using the Interstate Commerce Clause. Um, we are just making plans available for free on the internet. That's a whole lot more like free speech. Isn't it a little like opening Pandora, <laughs> Pandora's box though, telling everyone, hey, here's how you can make a self-driving car. You're basically, allowing them to do something that's illegal. Well, okay, so first off, it's not illegal. Um, you are responsible for complying with local uh, laws and, and regulations. My understanding is if somebody in California went and built one of these, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that would be legal um, because technically it's only an adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist, which are explicitly exempt under California law from being an autonomous vehicle. And California has the most restrictive laws 
somewhere like Texas, you know, uh, that's why Google and Uber are testing down there. Have you made any commitment to NHTSA not to test yourself? No, NHTSA, no. NHTSA does not regulate testing. We mm -hmm. all, the only thing I told NHTSA was that we would notify them before we were making a product available for sale okay. in the U.S., and we're not doing that. So what kind of interest have you gotten? We just open sourced it this morning. <laughs> I mean, are people excited? I mean, what's Absolutely. been the response? Yeah, I mean, already we have some people on our forums talking about building them, porting them to the old Tesla that didn't have autopilot. That's the really great thing about it being open. Those other cars that we don't support, people can download our code and add support for them. So when you said hello from Shenzhen, China, what did you mean? What I were was, you doing there? I was in Shenzhen, China. And more. I mean, were you working on self-driving car tech there? Were you looking into regulations there? We were. We were looking for manufacturing partners. Um, I did meet with a few companies there as well. Um, I'm not going to say who, but you know, the other thing about open sourcing this is there's so many more jurisdictions than the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. government may not like what I am doing, but some other government may. And hey, we'd love to work with you. Is China more open to it? I don't know. Um, to be honest, <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't. I, th I do not believe that it would be easier to navigate the regulatory environment in China where I don't speak Chinese versus the U.S. where I speak English, um, but I don't know. So, you know, folks like you have been willing to challenge regulators, but more broadly, you know, people don't want to take that kind of risk, and I wonder how do you think regulations are potentially holding back self-driving car technology? I mean, again, I, I can really only comment on my specific okay. case. Um, on my specific case, they tried to regulate a product that was not even available for sale. They actually gave me 10 days to, under oath, provide them the user manual for a product I'm not even taking orders for. So if I make a mistake in the user manual, they're going to Martha Stewart me, you know? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, premature. Uh, I, I think that was the problem. You have said that Elon Musk offered you a job to build uh, self-driving car software mm -hmm. for Tesla yeah. with a multi-million dollar bonus, you turned it down. You've also said that your software is just as good as the latest Tesla autopilot. I haven't said the latest, the previous Tesla the autopilot. So how does it compare to the latest? Autopilot's a bit better. Autopilot's a bit better because one of the key things they're doing is fleet learning. Mm -hmm. All of their autopilot cars are helping to train um, the other autopilot cars. Once a bunch of people start building these, they communicate with our network, we train, we improve, we ship out, we'll be able to beat autopilot. So what's your relationship with Musk and Tesla today? I don't know, I haven't heard from them. Uh, no, no new offers? No. <laughs> um, now, interestingly, uh, President-elect Trump has nominated uh, Elaine Chao to, mm -hmm. be, uh, to run the Department of Transportation. Do you have any uh, inkling of what, what um, she might mean for this industry? I looked into her policy positions a little bit. I couldn't find that much. Um, the woman who he chose to do the to lead the uh, transition committee on transportation, she came from a libertarian think tank who criticized California's steering wheel and pedal policy um, for being overly restrictive, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. um, there has not been a single death in autonomous vehicles to date. You can talk about the autopilot one, but that's a lot more of a cruise control system than you know a true autonomous vehicle. So to try to regulate something that has not only never caused a public safety problem, but also could potentially solve a huge public safety problem, to me seems very premature, so and I think that's the key word. Let's talk about the, the Tesla autopilot death that you just referred sure. to. Um, there's a debate about semi-autonomous yeah. versus fully autonomous, what's safer, what do you think is safer? What do you think most cars of the future will be, fully or semi-autonomous? Um, well, there's a long path to get to, semi uh, to get to fully autonomous, and I do not believe that there is a path to fully autonomous cars without first going through semi-autonomous. I think Tesla's uh, plan for attacking the whole problem is, is brilliant and going to succeed. Hmm. If Tesla is the iOS, we want to be the Android. You know what? We'll be the ones getting the 80%. We'll be a little bit worse for a bit, but I mean, that's, that's kind of the plan. Comma AI founder George Hotz there. Well, drones are swiftly buzzing into new and unfamiliar territory from military operations to food delivery. But there is one type of commercial drone you may not have seen yet, designed by Massachusetts-based drone maker Sci-Fi Works, which already works with the Air Force and UPS. Bloomberg's Ann Moss, who visited the company's FAA-approved test facility for an exclusive look. Hovering among the trees at peak foliage in this Massachusetts town is an unfamiliar object, a high-powered commercial drone. 
So what you're seeing here is our, our park system. And what the park is, is it's Persistence Aerial Reconnaissance and Communications Platform. These drones aren't moving much. In fact, if you look closely, you'll see that they're tethered to the ground. That's because they're designed for surveillance and communication. And the tether allows us to do a couple of things. It allows us to keep the bird in the air indefinitely. It's powering the system. It's also allowing us to move data up and down the tether. Lance Vandenbroek is CEO of Sci-Fi Works, which makes these drones, which can fly at 400 feet for up to 220 hours. Sci-Fi is partnering with state police, the U.S. Army, and big events such as concerts and marathons. The screen you're seeing here is actually coming off of that camera. Yeah, we can lock it in a car. This is our payload. This is a CM100 camera gives you 30 times optical zoom. The Danvers, Massachusetts-based Sci-Fi is the latest startup by Helen Grainer. From a technology point of view, we're rolling right along, or flying right along. <laughs> Grainer is an MIT graduate and co-founder of iRobot, the company behind the Roomba and the PackBot used in Iraq and Afghanistan. Sci-Fi has raised $36 million to date from investors and strategic partners such as Motorola and UPS. The drone maker successfully flew its first delivery with UPS this year, medicine to a hard to reach island. I think uh, initially going to inaccessible areas, emergency relief, rural areas, that's the right place to start. But no, I do envision drones bringing you your Starbucks coffee in the morning or bringing you uh, your pizza at, at night and maybe even bringing you uh, milk that you forgot at the store. The FAA cleared small commercial drones for takeoff last summer, but the promise of delivery drones has been limited by short battery lives, 45 minutes max. Tethered drones present a new set of challenges, but for sci-fi, it's a bigger picture play. The tethered drones, the persistent drones, they're making our drones really much more rugged, much more reliable. We get much more testing in, and that will lead to uh, much better, safer, more reliable delivery drones. Big players like Amazon, Alibaba, and other startups are competing in a global market for commercial applications of drone technology that's valued at $127 billion by PricewaterhouseCoopers. We do work with a number of government agencies, uh, public safety. We're starting to move into the private sector, so we're starting to see work with customers in the oil and gas space, telecoms, utilities. Sci-Fi currently employs 50 people and plans to double the size of the company in 2017. You know, it's an exciting time uh, for drones and the sky's the limit. Anne Moss to Bloomberg, Danvers, Massachusetts. That was Bloomberg's Anne Moss to at the Sci-Fi Drone Test Facility in Danvers, Massachusetts. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week during our new time slot beginning Monday. Tune in 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. And Monday, catch our interview with Russian billionaire Yuri Milner, founder of DST Global and one of Facebook and Twitter's earliest investors. We'll see you then in our new time slot. This is Bloomberg.